can zoos ever be big enough? I'm sure you've been to a zoo where you felt uncomfortable, that the exhibits were just too small. Good. As a zoo visitor, you should care about the welfare of the animals you pay to see. But it isn't as simple as bigger being better, or actually how you feel about it. What's much more important is the welfare of the animals. So how big should zoos be building their enclosures? What should they be putting into them? And if zoos really want to take welfare seriously, should some animals be disappearing from zoos altogether? Let's start with the basics. This exhibit here looks pretty good, right? Well, depending on the animal, they're going to experience it very differently. For a terrestrial animal, we can simplify their environment to a 2D space. The space is literally the surface area of the exhibit. But for our boreal species, we need to put on our 3D glasses. Now, are you ready to have your mind blown? Because we actually already live in a three-dimensional world. From an animal standpoint, their ability to move through that 3D environment is actually determined by their ability to move through that space. Branches of trees, platforms and ropes all adding to the usable space, as well as any gaps which they can cross through jumping or swinging. Even within a group such as primates, each species will differ, with their size, weight and agility influencing which areas of the exhibit they may have access to. Now you may consider birds to be in their element here, using every inch of available space, almost like a three-dimensional version of snake. Well, not exactly. While they may be able to cover large areas of the exhibit, simply offering a larger aviary isn't necessarily enough. Depending on the species, they will need a variety of perching, they'll have certain space or height requirements in order to take off and to land, and there will be a large variety of differences in their maneuverability within the air. So depending on the species you're designing for, their basic abilities need to match the basic makeup of the exhibit itself. But while snake doesn't really work for birds, it's a great segue onto these guys. But despite being a large group of diverse species with different habitat types and behaviors, the guidelines for keeping snakes across zoos, the pet industry, and breeding is often lacking. You see, this guy, and this one, this one, this one, this one. Yep, snakes spend a lot of their time resting, sleeping, and sunbathing curled up in a tight little coil. So you could easily see a snake curled up in a small enclosure and think, perfect, pats on the back all round. But research has shown that many snakes have a preference for larger exhibits and spend at least some of their time fully stretched out. So while the type of environment an animal needs, as well as their physical abilities, is an important starting point, what behaviours are you actually hoping to see? I remember as a kid, my parents used to take us to our local zoo about an hour from our house. Me and my sisters packed into the back of the car, excited for the day ahead. But as time went on, we'd be jostling for elbow space, knocking knees together, and by the end of it, snapping each other merely for breathing. We simply didn't want to be confined in that small space for any length of time. And the same idea was actually applied to zoo animals too. So during the early guesswork of how to house animals in captivity, if you saw a lot of fighting, give them a bit more space. But there's a problem there. A zoo housing two separate groups of tigers had some construction work and ended up with the tigers time-sharing a single exhibit. During that 50% reduction in space, they saw a reduction in aggression. Great! But alongside this, there was a drop in affiliative behaviours too. This conflict avoidance had led to a reduction in all behaviours, and a captive environment doesn't simply need to provide the opportunity for some of an animal's wild-type behaviours, or to promote behaviours which are simply easier to manage, but should offer a full spectrum of behaviours. And this is where the idea of space becomes a bit more complex. You see, increasing the size of an exhibit is better, at least to a point. There will be an increase in activity, a reduction in negative and abnormal behaviours, and an increase in the range of different behaviours displayed. But past a certain size, space alone doesn't seem to have the same impact. Now this might sound like it's getting a bit complex, but a complex environment is actually just one with lots of stuff. Now this can be 
biotic as well as abiotic, leading to the opportunity for individuals to explore different things within their environment, seek privacy and personal space, and perform a variety of behaviours which may not be possible in less complex exhibits. Take a simple hoofstock exhibit, boasting a stable yard and open paddock. This may seem suitable for a grazing herbivore such as a sitatunga. However, it's been shown that the addition of varied habitat leads to a preference for those more wild-type terrains of long grasses, reeds, and shallow water. A simply larger enclosure of short grasses wouldn't offer the same welfare benefits or provide the choice based on their behaviours. And this idea of choice is an important one. For a zoo animal, many of their needs are met by their keepers. And while keepers go to great lengths to provide variety through food and enrichment, a well-designed exhibit offers the animals those choices themselves. In reptiles, for example, heat sources can be positioned to offer a gradient in temperature and humidity, allowing individuals to choose where to position themselves within that range. And the same is also true in three-dimensional environments, with temperature, humidity, and even light varying at different levels. So on an individual basis, the complexity of an environment can be incredibly important. But there are actually two other groups that we have to consider. One of these is conspecifics, or the other animals you live with. As discussed before, the group and social dynamics can be affected by the size of an enclosure, but they can also be impacted by the complexity and organisation of the space. Larger, more complex exhibits will offer a variety of choice, different areas to explore or rest in, but also provide a number of different high value areas. Now this will allow a greater variation of expressed behaviours, as well as allowing individuals across the hierarchy spectrum the opportunity to access resources, hide themselves away and remove themselves from potentially dangerous situations. The other factor is that of the visitors. It's worth noting that designing specifically for visitor needs is unlikely to meet the needs of the animals. For many visitors, a natural enclosure like this one may feel much nicer. But for the animals, the ability to climb, explore different areas and maximise their usable space is far greater in a meshed over artificial exhibit than one landscaped for visitor appeal. And actually, trying to design for visitor experience can actually leave them worse off too. In an exhibit housing sharks and rays, visitors had the opportunity to see as well as touch the animals. And while that's a great experience for them, following a redevelopment of the exhibit, which removed the ability for people to touch the animals and increase the natural cover, the results were quite surprising. They saw improved welfare, increased space use, and a greater opportunity for visitors to see these species. And this is more than just a case of stopping visitors poking your animals. It's also been shown in a range of other animals that a more complex exhibit with more areas of cover actually offer the visitors more opportunity to see the animals as well as a wider range of behaviours. So taking all of this into account, zoos have developed guidelines to ensure high welfare across a range of different species, displaying high welfare not just in a single exhibit, but by replicating this knowledge across multiple collections, allowing for a thriving captive population. But I think there's something that we need to address. I'm generally pro-zoo, and I'm talking to you, who at the very least, I assume is open to hearing about the good work that zoos do. So how convenient that I focused largely on ideas and examples of how zoos can achieve high welfare for the animals in their care. I've even provided my references down below for if you want to dig a little deeper. But if you really care about animals, and if zoos are going to be progressive in their welfare considerations, they do have to face some facts. All animals aren't the same, and some seem to adapt poorly to captivity. Often these are large charismatic species with large home ranges, many of them predators, and often with notable stereotypic behaviours within a captive setting, as well as low reproductive success. So is it simply the case that we can't build exhibits to house these animals in good welfare? And as a result, should they be phased out of zoological collections altogether? During my career, I've been fortunate enough to work with a range of different species. But one of my earliest jobs was actually as a carnival keeper. Lions and tigers and bears. But one of the things I remember most is how much time I spent talking to and educating the public. And one comment made more than any other 
was in relation to the big cats never having the opportunity to hunt. And save for the occasional duck or pigeon landing in the wrong place, they were right. This ability to hunt, or in this case not, was long thought to be directly related to how well large carnivores fared in captivity. In fact, much of the historical enrichment for big cats, for example, has specifically targeted this. Now, while these aim to mimic hunting behaviors, notably improving muscle mass and encouraging movement from the animals, there are other factors that are at play. In fact, research has shown that both abnormal stereotypic behaviors and increased levels of infant mortality are more closely related to the annual home range size and the daily distance traveled than simply being a predator. Many small carnivores, in fact, have adapted to captivity much better than their larger, wide-ranging cousins, despite themselves being predators. But having a large annual home range or daily travel distances isn't simply a case of needing to move, at least not in terms of locomotion. In fact, both tigers and mink have been shown to walk further while pacing than their wild counterparts do. A wild individual will also have certain pressures, which will impact the home range size. But within captivity, those factors will be provided for by keepers. So any negative stress effects from those factors should be alleviated by good keepers who understand the animals in their care. So what's missing? Offering a full range of behavioral opportunities is certainly one thing. But what about the range of cognitive processes that would be involved? A study into tiger behavior considered the important behaviors for tigers, focusing on the evolutionary importance and motivation for different behaviors. What they found was that foraging behavior was of primary importance, which while obviously linked to food and involving physical movement, is specifically when those are as a result of focused cognitive processes. And this could be getting somewhere. From a cognitive perspective, simply walking around a traditional zoo exhibit and being served dinner on a plate is no match for the decision-making, information gathering, and exploration necessary to track your prey in the wild. And this is further supported by reconsidering the annual home range and daily travel distances. To simplify, a species with a large home range, but who uses a large proportion of that daily, fares far better in captivity than one who only uses a small part. Using a small proportion daily, having a wide-ranging but semi-nomadic lifestyle, means that for a wild individual, they are constantly being given a variety of decision-making opportunities. They're constantly investigating novel environments, including new sights, smells, and sounds, have a need to create multiple dens or nesting sites, as well as using navigation skills much more frequently than largely sedentary species. Introducing novel objects and smells into exhibits is already commonplace, and through the development of new exhibit designs, zoos are offering more complex and changeable habitats to the animals in their care. Examples of exhibit rotation as well as trail systems all offering greater variety on a daily basis to animals who require that cognitive stimulation. These advances in knowledge and the application of management techniques may prove effective in maintaining high welfare for some of the most challenging of species. By further developing these trail systems with specific resource points, exhibits and pathways, not simply offering random opportunity to discover something new, but by developing gate systems to give a greater control over the animal's movements, a journey to a key resource can then be manipulated by keepers, increasing the total travel distance as well as exposing them to different features along the way. Through the use of markers, either sight, sound, or smell, an individual could learn what their options are, with a short walk to a feeding opportunity or a longer one to somewhere to rest. So this type of design would offer a much more complete range of opportunities, both for keepers and for animals, which in time could improve the welfare of those species moving forward. So what do you think? Should zoos continue to develop and innovate for the welfare of those more challenging species? Or is it time to refocus their efforts onto those species already proven to fare well within captivity?